Hello everyone, welcome to Cashcroft TV. My name is Kaylin Ashcroft. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Ages of Empires, where we will be going through all the major world empires throughout history. In this episode, we will be covering the Kushan Empire and the Jin Dynasty, or I believe it's pronounced Jin Dynasty. And from each empire, we will also highlight a significant leader. So from the Kushan Empire, we will highlight Kanishka the first, also known as Kanishka the Great. As well from the Qin Dynasty, we will highlight Sima Yan, also known as Emperor Wu. And in the end, in the style of Plutarch's Parallel Lives, we will also have a comparison between the two leaders to kind of a throw back to one of my favorite authors, Plutarch, and also to learn a little bit more about the two leaders and as well their respective empires. Must be noted here that the Qin dynasty that we're covering is the particularly the Eastern and the Western periods, or actually technically the Western and then the Eastern periods, but there's also a later Qin dynasty, that uh, Qin dynasty that comes later, that's also spelled the same in Latin characters, J-I-N, so just important distinction to make. So this, and I will have the date range here too. And furthermore, I apologize in advance for my errors in pronunciation. I'm trying to find a balance because firstly, even if I were to pronounce everything correctly, which I will not be able to, I might disenfranchise non-native speakers, and uh, I'm not a native uh, Chinese speaker myself, but nonetheless, if I also do completely incorrect, I think that's wrong too. So I'm trying to find a balance, so when, when necessary, I'll also spell out words as well. So Qin, I believe, is the correct pronunciation, and it's J-I-N, but I'll pronounce it Qin for the course of the video. And as for Kushan Empire, it seems to be a little bit more phonetical, and I believe I will once again endeavor also to do my best. So once again, the structure is we will go through the Kushan Empire, then highlight the leader, Kanishka I, then we will cover the Qin Dynasty, and highlight the leader, Sima Yan, and then in the very end, we will have a comparison between Kanishka I and Sima Yan. So without further ado, we shall begin. So the Kushan Empire, and we're seeking to find the rise and fall in the style of the Shearer's rise and fall of the Third Reich, for example, which is also, I think, based on the decline and fall by Gibbon of the Roman Empire. So nonetheless, we're seeking to find the rise and fall of all these empires. So the Kushan Empire, also known as the Yuezhi, -E that's Y-U-E-Z-H-I, or U-A-G, Empire was a major Central Asian power that played a significant role in the South Asia in the history of South Asia and Central Asia. The rise and fall of the Kushan Empire can be traced through various historical sources, including Chinese chronicles, Indian literature, and archaeological findings. So, for some background, the uh, the, em the the Kushan Empire is considered a syncretic empire meaning forming of multiple different groups of people formed by the UAZ, UAG, in the Bactrian territory. So we've covered the Indo-Bactrian Empire as well in the early first century. It spread to encompass much of what is now Uzbekistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and northern India. At least as far as Sakita and Sarnath near Varnasi, where inscriptions have been found dating to the era of the Kushan Empire, Kanishka the Great, whom we will cover in a specific biography. So, covered a very large area of land, but very different cultural and ethnic groups as well. The Kushans were most probably one of the five branches of the UAZ Confederation, we've discussed quite a bit in the series. An Indo European nomadic people, possibly of Tocharian origin who migrated from northwestern China, perhaps in Xinjiang and Gansu, and settled in ancient Bactria. So they perhaps Indo-European, but they came from China, supposedly, then moved to Bactrian territory, which is approximately modern-day India, more even more so Afghanistan, perhaps, or even Bangladesh as well. And furthermore, they, and they migrated to ancient Bactria, and the founder of the dynasty, Kujulu Kadfaizis, followed Greek cultural ideas and iconography after the Greek of Bactrian tradition and was a follower of Shaivite sect of Hinduism. So very interesting balance between the Indo-Bactrian kingdom, for example, it comes from the descendants of the Macedonian Empire, so a lot of Greek traditions. And Greek was for a long time the official language of the Kushan Empire, so very quite a mix of different cultures and 
religions and languages. Two years later, Kushan kings Bhima, Kadphises, and Vasudeva II were also patrons of Hinduism too. And they employed elements of Zoroastrianism in their pantheon, so a mix of religion, therefore syncretic empire. They played an important role in the spread of Buddhism to Central Asia and China, ushering in a period of relative peace for 200 years, sometimes described as Pax Kushana. The Kushans possibly used the Greek language initially for administrative purposes, but soon began to use Bactrian languages. Kanishka sent his armies north of the Karakoram Mountains, a direct road from Gandhara to China. Remained under Kushan control for more than a century and encouraged travel across Kekororam and facilitated the spread of Mahayan Buddhism to China. The Kushan dynasty had diplomatic contacts with the Roman Empire, Sasanian Persia, and the Aksumite Empire, and the Han Dynasty as well of China, so interacting much with many empires that we have covered. The Kushan Empire was at the cent center of trade relations between the Roman Empire and China, so key geographical location. According to Elaine Danielou, this is a quote, for a time the Kushan Empire was the center point of the major civilizations, so sort of in between particularly the two ma most major ones, Han Dynasty and the Roman Empire. While much philosophy, art, and science was created within its borders, the only textual record of the empire's history today comes from inscriptions and accounts in other languages, particularly Chinese. So interesting that most of what we know about the Kushan Empire comes from other languages, from perhaps other dynasties or other empires. So, so starting with the rise and fall, so more detailed background. So the rise of the Kushan Empire, migration from UAZ, that's UAG, Y-U-E-Z-H-I. So the Kushan Empire had its origins in the migration of the UAZ people in UAG, people in Central Asian, Central Asian nomadic group. Around the second century BCE, the UAG were displaced by the Zhongnu, whom we've covered also as well as a specific empire, and migrated westward. They eventually settled in the region of the Oxus River, which is in modern day Amu Darya, where they came into contact with the Greco Bactrian Kingdom, who were speaking Greek, Bactri Bactrian, and we've covered in a previous episode. And once again, they're the Greco Bactrians, along with the Indo-Bactrians or the Indo-Greeks, for example, were um, all empires we've covered, but also they came from, their sort of broke off from the successor states of the Alexandrian Empire. So there's also this Greek tradition specifically in the nobility or the powerful classes. As for integration with the greco bactrian kingdom, the UAG integrated with the local culture and political structure of the greco bactrian kingdom. So think of this nomadic group that come to greco bactria and they integrate with the political structures. This integration was facilitated by the marriage of the UAG princess to the greco bactrian king. So they married into the royal family, or one of them at least, resulting in a new political entity that laid the foundation of the Kushan Empire. So almost a direct descendant of the greco bactrian kingdom. As for the establishment of the Kushan Empire, around 30 BCE, Kujula Kadphises emerged as a powerful leader among the UAG. He successfully unified various UAG tribes and established the Kushan Empire. Kujulu Kadphises is considered the founder of the Kushan dynasty. Um, as for expansion in the Golden Age, as to Kanishka the Great, whom we will cover in a specific biography, but, but some brief words here, one of the most renowned Kushan rulers was Kanishka the Great, or Kanishka I, who ascended to the throne around 78 CE, Common Era. Under Kanishka's rule, the Kushan Empire experienced its zenith. He expanded the empire's territory into northern India, Central Asia, and parts of China. As for cultural and religious flourishing, one of the most renowned Kushan rulers was, um, or, or pardon me, the Kushan Empire became a melting pot of diverse cultures blending Hellenistic, Persian, Indian, and Central Asian influences. The region became a hub for trade along the Silk Road, fostering economic prosperity. So perhaps it, because it was such a major trade location, that was what led to a lot of the mixing pot of cultures, religions, and languages. So a lot of people maybe traveling by, maybe fall in love and get married there, and vice versa, or even just by communicating, spread their culture. So very unique in, in this sense. The, the, 
And furthermore, during this period, Buddhism flourished and the Gandhara art style, a unique blend of Hellenistic and Indian artistic elements emerged. So Gandhara art is very fascinating, a mix between Greek and Indian influences. But moving to the decline and fall, as with every empire we've covered so far. The internal conflicts and succession issues. So after Kanishka's death, the Kushan Empire faced internal conflicts and secession problems. The empire was divided amongst his successors, leading to a weakened central authority. So kind of like the successor state of Alexander the Great, or later, as we shall see, with Charlemagne. As for the pressures as well, external pressures. So almost all these empires are the culmination of internal and external forces. So the pressures from the Sasanian Persia. The Sasanian Persians, under Shapur I, launched military campaigns against the Kushans, capturing their western territories, and this further weakened the, the empire. So the west collapsed first, mostly due to the cause of the Sasanian Persians, who have been a formidable force for the Persians, generally had been a formidable force for a long period of time, as we've covered in the Persian Empire episode. As for the White Huns invasion, in the 4th century CE, the Kushan Empire faced invasions by from the White Huns, also known as Hephthalites, Hephthalites, and the White Huns overran the region, contributing to the ultimate collapse of the Kushan Empire. So on one hand, they have from the west the Sasanian Persians, and on the east, the, the Huns, uh, or, uh, or pardon me, from more, maybe more north as well, the, the White Huns came as well. So we will cover the Han Dynasty as well, the Han Empire as well. More, more correct to call it an empire. But thus, so therefore, facing threats on, on multiple sides and internal issues ultimately led to its decline in approximately 375 CE. But as for its legacy, despite its eventual decline and fall, the Kushan Empire left a lasting impact on the cultural and religious landscapes of Central Asia. The Gandhara art style continued to influence the art of the region for centuries, and the spread of Buddhism left Buddhist Buddhism during the Kushan period has a prof had a profound la and lasting impact on the Indian subcontinent. So a thought experiment we presented many times before is if the Kushan Empire never existed, to what extent would we have Buddhism today, or to what extent would Buddhism have have expanded? Impossible to say, but definitely the Kushan Empire was some contributing factor. So as for Kanishka the Great, or Kanishka the First as a specific biography, likely the most important ruler of the Kushan Empire is often considered Kanishka the Great, and therefore we seek to find a biography of his life. So Kanishka the First, or Kanishka the Great, often referred to, was the emperor of the Kushan dynasty, under whose reign from approximately 127 to 150 CE, the empire reached its zenith, its pinnacle. He is famous for his military, political, and spiritual achievements. He is a descendant of Kajulu Kataphyses, who was the founder of the Kushan Empire, and came to rule an empire extending from Central Asia and Gandhara to Pataputra on the Gangetic Plain. The main capital of the empire was located at Purusapura, or not modern day, Peshawar in Gandhara, with another major capital in Mathura. Coins of Kanishka were found in Tripuri, which is in present day Jabalpur. I've been to India before, but not in these regions, and I hope someday to go back as well, maybe multiple times, as I still consider myself quite young. Although he never converted to the religion, his conquest and patronage of Buddhism played an important role in the development of the Silk Road and in the transmission of Mahayan, uh, Maha, Mahayana Buddhism from Gandhara across the Karakoram range in China. So sort of expanding Buddhism into China. Around 127 CE, he replaced Greek with Bactrian as the official language of administration in the empire. So also, also a very significant change, maybe because Greek was sort of there wasn't a constant influx of Greek people, and sort of group, Greek was often the ruling class, so descendants from the the Alexandrian Empire. But it seemed probably more natural to accept Bactrian, as there was probably a larger population of Bactrian speakers, so likely a, a good policy. 
So, as for, um, once again, his name, Kanishka I, reign around 78 CE, or pardon me, 127 to 150 CE, but also others have said around 78 CE to 103 CE. So the dates are, there's differing dates we have here, and I know I mentioned earlier, earlier dates. So we can either say 127 to 150 CE, or 78 CE to 103 CE, but I don't think it's important to memorize these dates. Basically, it's in or within the first two centuries of the world of history of the common era, as we call it. And nonetheless, it's um, just those are pretty tight, pretty tight ranges. So, and it's not. I don't think it's useful for our purpose to just memorize dates and the exact specific date. It's not as important as sort of the relative dates. So, as for his background and early life. Kanishka was born into the ruling family of the Kushan Empire, and his exact date of birth is not precisely known. He ascended to the throne after his father, uh, after his father um, passed away around um, either 78 CE or 127 CE, and his father was Vima Kadphyses, but he was a descendant of Kajulu Kadphyses, who was the founder of the empire. As for his, that being Kanishka's military campaigns and expansion, Kanishka inherited a relatively stable empire but sought to expand its boundaries. His military campaigns were notably successful, leading to the expansion of the Kushan Empire into northern India, Central Asia, and even parts of China. So an expansionist policy on all fronts, or many fronts at least. The extent of his empire made Kanishka one of the most powerful rulers of his time. As for his patronage of Buddhism, Kanishka is perhaps best known for his patronage of Buddhism. He convened the fourth Buddhist council around 100 CE in Kashmir. This council aimed to reconcile the different Buddhist sects and compile the teachings into a standardized canon. So, sort of centralization, as we see, kind of maybe similar to the Catholic Church and sort of centralization of the religion. Kanishka's support of Buddhist, Buddhism helped the religion flourish in the Kushan Empire and facilitated its spread along the Silk Road. Once again, the thought experiment now for an individual. If Kanishka never existed, to what extent would Buddhism have spread within the Kushan Empire and more broadly? Impossible to measure, but something to consider. As for Gandhara art and cultural flourishing, during Kanishka's rule, the Kushan Empire became a melting pot of diverse cultures blending Hellenistic, Persian, Indian, and Central Asian influences, perhaps likely being because it is the center of trade for these regions or these areas. The Gandhara art style, characterized by the fusion of Greek and Indian artistic elements, flourished during this period. The art and culture of the Kushan Empire under Kanishka reflected the cosmopolitan nature of his realm. As for trade and economic prosperity under Kanishka, Kanishka's empire was strategically located along the Silk Road, as previously mentioned, facilitating trade and cultural exchange between the East and West. This contributed to the economic prosperity of the Kushan Empire during his reign. As for his construction projects, Kanishka is believed to have undertaken various construction projects, including the construction of stupas and monasteries. Stupas are temples, essentially. And, but both of them have religious purposes, most commonly, and he, his support for Buddha, Buddhism is reflected in the architectural developments of this period. As for his legacy, Kanishka's legacy, oh, pardon me, before that, death and succession, pardon me. The exact circumstances of Kanishka's deaths are unclear, and there is some debate among historians about this date as well. It is generally believed that he died around 103 CE, but some say that's when his reign began, so that's uh, dates are significantly disputed. After his death, the Kushan Empire faced internal conflicts and succession issues, leading to a period of decline. So often, you know, I don't think one can call it the pinnacle if following it, it didn't have decline, because if it kept continued to rise after him, he would not have been the zenith, or not have been the pinnacle. So. Maybe he could have done a better job in determining his succession. As for his legacy, Kanishka's legacy lies in his role as a powerful and influential ruler who expanded the Kushan Empire to its zenith. His patronage of Buddhism and cultural flourishing during his reign left a lasting impact on the artistic and religious landscape of Central and South Asia. The Gandhara art style, in particular, continued to influence the region's art 
for centuries. Kanishka's contributions to Buddhism and the cultural heritage of the Kushan Empire endure in historical records and archaeological remnants. So that is the Kushan Empire and Kanishka the First, or Kanishka the Great. We'll now discuss the content of the slide. So the title, Kushan Empire and Kanishka the First. It was a syncretic empire formed by UAG in Bactrian land. So a UAG, part of the confederation, so a group of UAG moved to Bactria, married into the royal family of Bactria, formed their own empire. It's a very condensed history. From and another title, from Indo-European nomadic people of possibly Tocharian origin who migrated from China. Significant leader, Kanishka I, Empire Kushan, period 30 to 375 CE. Modern location, Uzbekistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India. Million square kilometers, 2.5 million square miles, 0.97% of the world, 1.86%. But we must note that this is excluding Antarctica, but also some of the most contested or most busy um, or most developed areas at the time. So, and this is one of the larger empires we have covered as well. Very massive, 2.5 million square kilometers. Some of the famous Greek, well, all of the Greek, famous Greek city-states, including Athens, Sparta, never got this large. Capital cities was Peshaw, is modern day Peshawar, Taxila, and Mathura. Government was a monarchy. Common languages was the Greek, which was the official until circa 127, when uh, it was changed by Kanishka the first, and when it became Bactrian, which was the official language as of 127 C, circa approximately. Gan and as well Gandhari, Prakrit, and hybrid Sanskrit. <coughs> Pardon me. Religion was Hinduism, Buddhism, and Zoroastrianism. I always pronounce that wrong. Zoroastrianism, pardon me. And population estimate was several to tens of millions. I would estimate it might even been larger, but it's very difficult to measure, and it's based on archaeological records, based on agricultural records, and also sometimes it includes and excludes slaves as well, so it's very hard to measure, but still quite large, given the time. In the top left, we have a uh, coin that features Kanishka the first. To the right of that, we have some information. So it was preceded by, the Kushan Empire was preceded by the Indo-Greek Kingdom, the Indo-Parthian Kingdom, the Indo-Scythians, the Northern Satraps, Western Satraps, and the Mahamegavahanas. And it was succeeded by the Sasanian Empire, Persian, and the Kushano-Sasanian Kingdom, the Gupta Empire, the Kidra Kidarites, the Nagas of Padmavati, and the Nagas of Vindhyatabi. We will cover many of these either in specific episodes, as we have already done for many, and or in by um, connection to other major empires. So hopefully many of these names, if, if this is the last video you watched, they will all make sense. But if this is the first video you're watching, they will all eventually make sense. Below that, we have an image of the fortress of Shar Izahak, which is very fascinating. Looking at everything one kind of thinks of when they think of an ancient castle so on the cliffs, and it'd be terrifying to fall down there. Um, below that, we have the fortress of Kampir Tepe, very uh, strong structure, um, very um, sharp edges, very beautiful as well. And to the right of that, we have the fortress of Aya, Ayaz Kala, built up on a mountain, very beautiful. Looks reminds me of some of the palaces I see I've seen today in the Rajasthan region of, of of India. So, but it's beautiful up on this hill, and it seems to be at least two of these three seem to be definitively on a hill. So, obviously, a tactical advantage. Maybe they're skilled with the bow, and even the one um, the fortress of Kapir Tepe seems to also be on some hill. And in the top right, we have a large map of the Kushan Empire, as we can see there. Border the Western Satraps, the Himalayas. We can see the um, oh, uh, yeah, the Himalayas here, China here. They interacted with, and, but a massive square of land here, and, um, a plot of land here, and the Indus Valley. The first episode we have covering Indian context is the Indus Valley civilization. So I hope you have checked that out. And if you don't, if you have not, I hope you do, and I'm thankful if you have. Um, that would give a kind of a good primer of what was happening in India before these empires started to arise. In particular, this empire is after Alexander the Great, so it has this Greek influence too, so I'm not quite isolated. So that is the Kushan Empire and Kanishka I. We will discuss the leader a bit more in comparison at the end. 
So the Qin Dynasty, spelled J-I-N. The term Qin Dynasty refers to several dynasties in Chinese history. So this is referring to the, the West, Western, and Eastern Qin Dynasty. But there's later, there's a, one that comes much later as well that we will likely or likely cover as well. Certainly in, indirectly, but maybe also a dedicated episode as well. So the term Xin Dynasty refers to several dynasties in Chinese history. Two of the most notable are the Western Xin Dynasty, which reigned from circa 265 or 266 to 316 CE, and the Eastern Xin Dynasty, which reigned from 317 to 420 CE, or common era, common era. Below and following, we shall discuss uh, the, the rise and fall of both of these dynasties. But also, once again, not to be confused with the Xin Dynasty Empire, which reigned from 1115 to 1234 CE, so many, many years later. So the Xin Dynasty, or the Two Xins, was an imperial dynasty of China that existed from 266 to 420 CE, or it included both the Western and the Eastern. It was founded by Sima Yan, who we'll discuss in specific biography, or also known as Emperor Wu the eldest son of Sima Zhao, Z-H-A-O, who had previously been declared king of Xin. The Xin dynasty was preceded by the Three Kingdoms period, as we discussed in an episode, and was succeeded by the Sixteen Kingdoms, which we will likely cover as well, if not in a specific episode, indirectly, in northern China and the Liu Song dynasty in southern China. So after it collapsed, it fell into the Sixteen Kingdoms in the north, and the Liu Song Dynasty in the south. There are two main divisions in the history of the dynasty. The Western Xin from 266 to 316 CE was established by a successor of Cao Wei, or Chao Wei, which was one of the three kingdoms during the Three Kingdoms period. After Sima Yan usurped the throne from Cao Cao, C A O Chao Huan, H U A N. The capital of Western Xin was initially Luoyang, though it later moved to Chang'an, which is in modern day Qi'an in Shanxi province. In 280 CE, after conquering Eastern Wu, the Western Xin kingdoms, um, the Western uh, Xin king, uh, reunited China, proper for the first time since the end of the Han Dynasty ending the Three Kingdoms era. So after the Han Dynasty, there was this division to the Three Kingdoms era, and it was the Xin Dynasty, particularly the Western, as it was often called, um, or retroactively called because it's divided between the Western and the Eastern, but nonetheless reunified China for the first time since the Han Dynasty, or um, and ending, and, and therefore ending the Three Kingdoms period. However, 11 years later, a series of civil wars known as the War of the Eight princes erupted in the dynasty which weakened it considerably. Subsequently, in 304 CE, the dynasty experienced a wave of rebellions and invasions by non-Han ethnicities termed the Five Barbarians, of one of which would be the Xiongnu, whom we've covered, who went on to establish several short-lived dynastic states in northern China. This inaugurated the chaotic and bloody Sixteen Kingdoms era of Chinese history in which states in the north rose and fell in rapid succession, constantly fighting both one another and the Xin. Han Zhao, one of the northern states established during this disorder, sacked Luoyang in 311 CE, captured Shang'an in 316, and executed Emperor Min of Xin in 318 CE, ending the Western Xin era. Sima Ryu, who succeeded Emperor Min then reestablished the Xin Dynasty in its, uh, with its capital in Xi'an Kang, J I A N K A N G, which is in modern day Nanjing, Nanjing, N A N J I N G, inaugurating the Eastern Xin Dynasty in 317, which ended in 420 CE. The Eastern Xin Dynasty remained in near constant conflict with the northern states for, its most, for most of its existence and it launched several invasions on the north with the aim of recovering its lost territories. Notably, in 383 CE, the Eastern Xin inflicted a devastating defeat on the former Qin, that's Q-I-N, and a de-ruled state that had briefly unified northern China. So, shut down the Qin, 
or the Qin um, former Qin dynasty. In the aftermath of the battle, the former Qin state splintered, and Xin, that's J-I-N once again, armies captured the lands south of the Yellow River. The eastern Xin was eventually usurped by General Liu Yu in 420 and replaced by the Liu Song dynasty. The eastern Xin dynasty is considered the second of the six dynasties. So, starting with uh, western Xin, and starting with its rise from 265 to 316 CE, the founding and Sima Yan. The western Xin dynasty was founded by Sima Yan, who later became Emperor Wu. He was a general of the Wei dynasty, one of the three kingdoms that emerged after the fall of the Eastern Han dynasty. Sima Yan usurped the throne and established the Western Xin dynasty in 265 CE. So it came from one of the three kingdoms, Cao Wei, or Chao Wei. As for his reunification of China, Emperor Wu sought to reunify China, which had been divided during the Three Kingdoms period. He successfully defeated the rival state Shu Han in 263 CE and Wu in 280 CE, reuniting the country under the rule of Western Xin. As for political struggles and rebellion, the Western Xin faced internal political struggles, including conflicts among powerful clans and court officials. Additionally, agrarian rebellions such as the War of the Eight Princes, 291 to 306 CE, weakened the central authority of the dynasty. As for the fall to the barbarian invasions, the Western Xin faced significant external threats from nomadic groups, particularly the Xiongnu, whom we have an episode on, and the Di people. In 311 CE, the Xiongnu chief Liu Yao captured the Xin capital, Luoyang, marking the end, the beginning of the end of the Xin, Western Xin dynasty. The last Western Xin ruler, Emperor Hui, H-U-A-I, surrendered to the Di people in 316 CE, leading to the collapse of the dynasty. But then came the Eastern Xin dynasty from 317 to 420 CE, establishment and political division. So after the fall of Western Xin, the remnants of the Xin court fled eastward and established the Eastern Xin dynasty in 317 CE. The Eastern Xin rule from the city of Xi'an Kang, that's J-I-A-N-K-A-N-G, which is modern day Nanjing, N-A-N-J-I-A-N-G. However, Northern China remained under control of various non-Han ethnic groups. As for Southern and Northern dynastic periods, during the Eastern Xin Dynasty, China entered a period known as the Southern and Northern Dynasties. Northern China was divided among various non-Han Chinese dynasties, while the Southern Dynasties, including Eastern Xin, ruled the South. So Eastern Xin sort of maintained in the South, but in the North it was quite fragmented and a lot of non-Han people having power. But moving to weaknesses and decline of the Second Period, the Eastern Xin Dynasty faced internal strife, including political corruption and infighting amongst powerful clans. So something that has been sort of almost necessary to the success, or at least sufficient for the success. Well, I think it would be necessary because if the empires were declining because of centralization, therefore it would be sufficient. But nonetheless, lack of centralized authority or lack of central control seemed to be one of the leading causes of the decline of the Xin dynasty as with many other Chinese, ancient Chinese dynasties particularly. Additionally, it, it contended with external threats from nomadic groups such as the Xiongnu and the Di people and neighboring states and the five barbarians more broadly. These factors contributed to the gradual decline of the Eastern Xin. As for the fall of, to the Yu Liu Song dynasty, in 420 CE, Liu, the Liu Song dynasty replaced the Eastern Xin as the ruling power of southern China, marking the official end of the Eastern Xin dynasty. The period of division continued with the establishment of pardon me, various southern dynasties and the ongoing rule of the northern non-Han Han Chinese dynasties. But as for its legacy, while the Xin dynasty did not leave a lasting unified empire, as no other empire had, its history is significant as a transitional period between the Three Kingdoms and the Southern and Northern Dynasties. 
The fragmentation of China during this time set the stage for the subsequent reunification under the Xu and Tang dynasties. As for a biography of Simu, Sima Yan, to learn a bit more about particularly the Western Xin dynasty, we could only could only highlight one leader for parallelism, so we're focused on Western um, Sima Yan as the founder of the Xin dynasty more broadly. For the Western Xin dynasty, one notable ruler is Sima Yan, who founded the dynasty. But if we were to look at an Eastern Xin dynasty, what I would recommend Emperor Yuan of Xin, or Sima Ri. Ru, Ru, Ri, or it's S I N A R U I Ri. I think it's Ri. Um, but therefore, we will focus on Sima Yan for the course of this episode. So, also known as Emperor Wu of Xin, his personal name was Sima Yan. He lived from approximately 236 to uh, May 16th of 290. And he was the grandson of Sima Yi and nephew of Simo Shi, the son of Simu Sima Zhao, Z H A O. He became the first emperor of the Xin dynasty after forcing Cao Huan, the last emperor of the state of Cao Wei, to abdicate to him. So took control of Cao Wei, which was one of the three kingdoms during the Three Kingdoms period. He reigned from 266 to 290 CE, and after conquering the state of Eastern Wu in 280, was emperor of the reunified China. Emperor Wu was also known for his extravagance and sensuality, especially after the unification of China. Legends boasted of his incredible potency among 10,000 concubines. 10,000 concubines, and a concubine is in some ways a slave, but often a sexual slave. 10,000 concubines. Emperor Wu was commonly viewed as a generous and kind, but also wasteful. His generosity and kindness undermined his rule, as he became overly tolerant of the noble, noble family, so maybe he should have led with a hard, stronger, harder fist or more iron fist. Um, a political bureaucratic landlord class from Eastern Han and, from, and as well from the Tang Dynasty, so these noble families sort of led to the decline of the Western Xin Dynasty at least. Yeah. And but also lack of centralization was also one of the leading causes of the decline of the Eastern Sin Dynasty, as we shall see too, or as we saw. But he was also accused of corrupt, corruption and wastefulness, which drained the people's resources. Further, when Emperor Wu established the Sin Dynasty, he was concerned about the regime's stability and believing that his, the predecessor state, Cao Wei, had been doomed by its failures to empower the princes of the imperial clan, he greatly empowered his uncles, his cousins, and his sons with authority, so strengthen the royal family, because he saw that in Cao Wei, he believed it was the lack of power in the royal family, so he gave power to his uncles, children, cousins, and his sons with authority, including independent military authority, but it must be noted here we have all, all men, he's giving power mostly to men. This ironically led to the destabilization of the Western Sin, as the princes engaged in inter- Nessine struggle known as the War of the Eight Princes. So he gave power to all of his uncles, nephews, and sons, but then they started fighting amongst each other and even threatening his own authority. Soon after his death, and then Wu Hu uprisings that nearly destroyed the Western Xin and forced his successor, Eastern Xin, to relocate to the region of the South Huai River. So maybe not the best idea. It's reading about Diocletian, who was one of the Roman empires, and what he did was not to go on too much of a tangent, but he, as soon as he became into power, the, every empire up until him had been either murdered or burned or burned alive or just did not have good fate. So what he did is he made another emperor. So he was sort of the wise older emperor, but he selected another emperor, Maxim, Maximian, Maximian, I believe. And then he selected two others known as Caesars. So there were really four who had the purple under Diocletian. And supposedly it was actually one of the, the best periods of the Roman Empire because the power was divided, which seems ironic when we could talk about centralized power, but I think it was necessary that they all appreciated it. Diocletian. In this case, it might not have been as successful because maybe the uncles or nephews and sons did not significantly appreciate him. Maybe it's because he gave power to too many people. Maybe if he only gave to three with one maybe favorite, maybe it would have been better. Who knows? Maybe the, um, so just suggesting maybe the Diocletian method, whereas if you pick one one 
nephew, for example, must be younger, and then two other nephews, but one nephew primary, maybe it might have worked better, but who knows. So for the details, name Sima Yan, also Emperor Wu of Qin, reigned 265 to 290 CE. Background and early life. So Sima Yan was born in 236 CE and the son of Sima Zhao, a prominent general of the Wei dynasty during the Three Kingdoms period. That's Chao Wei, C-A-O-W-E-Y, W-E-I, pardon me. Sima Yan grew up in a family that played a crucial role in the political and military affairs of the time. As for his rise to power, after the death of his father in 265 CE, Sima Yan seized the opportunity to usurp the throne from the last ruler of the Wei dynasty, Cao Chao Wan. Sima Yan declared the establishment of the Western Xin dynasty and assumed the title of Emperor Wu. As for his reunification of China, Emperor Wu's early reign was marked by military campaigns to reunite China, which had been divided during the Three Kingdoms period. He successfully defeated the rival state, Shu Han, in 263 CE, one of the other of the Three Kingdoms, and Wu in 280 CE, so he eventually conquered all three of the Three Kingdoms from the Three Kingdoms period, which I have an episode on, which I hope you've checked out, and if you have not, I'd be grateful if you did, and if you have, thank you very much. I'm grateful. Reuniting the country under his rule of the Western Xin Dynasty. As for his political reforms, Emperor Wu implemented various political reforms aimed at strengthening the state centralized authority of the imperial court. He sought to curb the power of regional warlords and maintain a balance among influential families. As for central and intellectual, uh, cultural and intellectual patronage, Emperor Wu was known for his support of culture and scholarship. He patronized Confucian scholars and encouraged the arts, but maybe a little bit too much because he was more, a little bit uh, wasteful, he was accused of. The imperial court became a center of intellectual activity during his reign, but maybe an aggregate better, too much than none at all. As for challenges and internal strife, despite the initial successes, the Western Xin dynasty faced internal challenges, including political infighting between the powerful clans, even within his own family. The War of Eight Princes, 291 to 306 CE, was a notable conflict that weakened the central authority of the dynasty. As for barbarian invasions and decline, Emperor Wu faced external threats from nomadic groups, including the Xiongnu and Di people. In 311 CE, the Xiongnu chieftain Liu Yao captured the Xin capital, Luoyang, leading to a period of decline for the Western Xin dynasty. As for his death and legacy, Emperor Wu died in 290 CE, and the Western Xin Dynasty continued to decline after his death. The subsequent decades saw the fragmentation of the dynasty, leading to its eventual collapse in 316 CE. Emperor Wu's reign is remi- remembered as a period of both political consolidation and internal strife during a pivotal time in Chinese history. So maybe he did not have the best succession plan, but he was the one able to conquer all three kingdoms, which I think is something that even the best success planners, successor planners could not have done. That's something that only he was capable of doing. But maybe he was in the right place in the right time, which would be the Tolstoyan argument in War and Peace, the epilogue. Contrasts on Heroes, Hero Worship and the Heroic in History by Carlyle, who says it is a few people who do change society. So both ends of the debate. So to discuss the content of the slides, so title we have Xin Dynasty and Sima Yan was preceded by the Three Kingdoms period and succeeded by the Sixteen Kingdoms period in the north and the Liu Song Dynasty later defeating the Eastern Xin Dynasty. Western Xin reigned from 266 to 316 CE and the Eastern Xin from 317 to 420 CE. Missing this bracket there, pardon my apologies. Significant leader Sima Yan, Empire Xin. Period, 266 to 420 CE. Modern locations, China, Mongolia, North Korea, and Vietnam. Million square kilometers, 3.1. Million square miles, 1.2. Percent of the world, excluding Antarctica, 3. Uh, pardon me, 2.30, which is ma- absolutely massive, especially considering there's warring states within this region. So very um, 
kept, well, they were warring states and they were called the Three Kingdoms, but they'd been having wars for a long period of time, so it wasn't an easy area of land to conquer. And 3.1 is even larger than the Kushan Empire, which is larger than many empires we covered before. To put it in perspective, the ancient Athens and ancient Sparta were not even 0.01% of the world, so this is massive. Capital was Luoyang from 266 to 311 CE, Shang'an from 312 to 316 CE, and Jiankang from 317 to 420 CE. Government was a monarchy. Common languages was Middle Chinese. Religion, Buddhism, Taoism, and Chinese folk religion. I think it was actually pronounced Taoism. Population tends to over 100 million. So a very large range, but given the population of China today, which is, I believe, well, I believe still over 1 billion, but it's India actually apparently is now the largest population in the world. But that this might change by the time you're watching this. But as of today, which is the 5th of December 2023, India does supposedly have a larger population than China. But nonetheless, China's population today is still very large, although declining, but um, over 100 million during the time in the early the first 500 some centuries. It was very large. In terms of images, in the top left, we have an image of Sima Yan himself, as we can see, he's well, not a larger individual, and, you know, he's wasteful, like they say, he must have eaten a lot and such, but nonetheless, 10,000 concubines, which are certainly a lot, I don't think one can even rec identify 10,000 faces, if that was their only occupation. To the right of that, we have the image of the Sima dynasty, the character, which is, we can try to analyze what it might signify. It might just indicate the sound, but I see sort of a structure, um, maybe the sky, maybe some control, or maybe some gods, maybe something something in heavens, hard to say. But um, supposedly the Chinese characters all do have some connection to their meaning, so it'd be interesting to analyze it more deeply. Maybe it is just correlated with the sound here, though. To the right, we have a Hun Ping jar of the Western Xin, period with Buddhist figures. So as mentioned, you know, the Kushans, for example, were bringing Buddhism into China. There was Buddhism in China during this period, at least during the Western Xin period. To the right, we have a Western Xin porcelain female figurine that we can get an image of what the women might have looked like and how they might have dressed. To the right of that and down, we have a scene from the Admonitions Scroll, which was a Chinese narrative painting on silk based off the poem of Chang Hua from 232 to 300 CE to reprimand Empress Xia, J-I-A, from 257 to 300 CE to provide advice to women in the imperial court. So it's meant for sort of like a, a book for women written on silk. It's traditionally considered as a Sin court painting by Gu Kaizi in circa 345 to 406 CE. Below that, we also have a British Museum copy of the admonitions of the instructions to the court ladies attributed to Gu Kaizi as well, but perhaps uh, produced it during the Tang Dynasty. So, it's just interesting that they sort of do have this literature. It wasn't just war, they also had art, music, and poetry, and, and storytelling. To the, up and to the right, we have contracted history. We have the establishment on the 8th of February, 266 CE. Reunification of China, 1st of May, 280 CE. That's after under Xin rule. That's all three of the three kingdoms. Xin evacuates to the region south of the Huai River, and the eastern Xin begins in 317 CE. Abdication to Liu Song dynasty in 10th of July, 420 CE. The emperors, the emperor Wu of Xin, was the first emperor of Xin from 266 to 290 CE. The first eastern Xin emperor was Emperor Yuan of Xin from 318 to 323 CE. And the last was Emperor Gong of Xin from 419 to 420 CE. In the top right, we have a map of the Xin Dynasty. I've really expanded it out just to give a perspective of where the Roman Empire is all the way over here. The Shan Bay, as we've covered, Confederation, important empire that we have covered. And uh, we have the Western satraps here, the little Kushans here, little Kushans. It's titled, I don't know why they put little Kushans, but um, maybe it was a period they were called that, or maybe that, I don't know why that's there. I did not put it there, but uh, nonetheless, the Kushan Empire would have been here. And yeah, so it's a huge area of land, 3.1 million square kilometers, 2.3% of the world, excluding Antarctica. So, in, now a comparison between Kanishka I and Simi Yan and the style of Plutarch's parallel lives. 
not necessarily like they're particularly similar or particularly different, but it's because they're both the leaders highlighted from the two empires that happen to be paired together. So Kanishka I of the Kushan Empire and Sumer Yan, or Emperor Wu of the Western Sim Dynasty, were influential rulers in different regions and periods in history. While they were not contemporaries, a comparison will hopefully reveal some interesting similarities and differences between the two. So geographical and cultural context. So Kanishka the first of the Kushan Empire. Kanishka ruled the first ruled of the Kushan Empire, which had its heartland in Central Asia and extended to South Asia. The empire was a crossroads of various cultures, including Hellenistic, Persian, Indian, and Central Asian influences. As for Sima Yan of the Western Sin Dynasty, Sima Yan founded the Western Sin Dynasty in China, a period characterized by the unification of China after the Three Kingdoms period. The culture of the Western Sin was deeply rooted in Confucianism, and it marked a transitional phase between the Southern and Northern dynasties. So, the difference here is that Sima Yan actually founded uh, um, his empire, whereas Kanishka I sort of reached its zenith. Maybe Sima Yan was, would not have been able to reach to create its zenith, but maybe Kanishka I would not have been able to create an empire, so we cannot say, but just different lives they lived. As for their respective military achievements, Kanishka I is known for his military campaigns that extended and expanded the Kushan Empire into northern India, Central Asia, and parts of China. His conquests contributed to the economic and cultural prosperity of the empire. As for Sima Yan, the Emperor Wu reunified China under the Western Sin Dynasty by defeating rival states. His military campaigns brought an end to the Three Kingdoms period and laid the groundwork for political stability in China. So both of them expanded their territories. Maybe Sima Yan well, had to more significantly relatively expanded his because he grew it essentially by three times the size um, from Chao Wei to, to the other two of the three kingdoms. But nonetheless, Kanishka I might have been the better military strategist because maybe he was getting those last or those states that had been not been able to be conquered by his predecessors. So maybe Sima Yan was getting the low-hanging fruit. But if that were true, why did no other leader do as he did? before. As for patronage of religion and culture, Kanishka I is renowned for his patronage of Buddhism. He convened the Fourth Buddhist Council, which aimed to reconcile the different Buddhist sects and standardize the Buddhist canon, so centralizing but also being sort of open to the different sects of Buddhism. The Gandhara art style as well, a unique blend of Hellenistic and Indian elements flourished during his reign. As for Sima Yan, Emperor Wu supported Confucianism and patronized Confucian scholars. So one focused on Buddhism, one focused on Confucianism. And while not it is directly involved in religious matters, it contributed to the cultural and intellectual developments of the Western Sin Dynasty, maybe even unscrupulously. As for political consolidation and internal challenges, Kanishka I and the Kushan Empire faced internal conflicts, including the succession issues and power struggles, perhaps by giving power to his uncles and nephews and sons among influential clans contributing to its eventual decline. As after, if he was at the zenith, subsequent leaders were declining. But he was not under his reign, it did not decline itself, so maybe he was not the problem. As for Sima Yan, Emperor Wu implemented political reforms aimed at consolidating central authority. But the Western Sin Dynasty faced internal strife, including conflicts among powerful clans, as seen in the War of the Eight Princes. And part of me, it was Sima Yan who gave power to his uncles and nephews and sons. Whereas Kanishka I, those internal strikes were sort of natural due to the sort of different cultural classes, particularly, for example, the Greeks' descendants had a lot of power, but then they moved over to Bactrian. So, but nonetheless, Kanishka I was not the one who was giving power to his uncles, nephews, and sons. That was Sima Yan, so my apologies for that. But as for the decline and succession, Kanishka I, the decline of the Kushan Empire, is associated with external invasions, particularly by the White Huns, contributing to eventual declaps. As for Sima Yan, the Western Qin Dynasty, Xin Dynasty faced decline due to external invasions by nomadic groups and internal conflicts leading to its collapse in 316 CE. So both of them sort of could not foresee that their empires would collapse. Both of them probably in their own lifetimes, <coughs> pardon me, believed that their empire would never end. Kanishka was at the pinnacle. Simiya was at the birth of a new empire. So both of them did not like, foresee the internal struggles and external threats that both of their empires would eventually face. 
hence they are the most uh, significant in both of their respective empires. So thus, while Kanishka I and Sima Yan ruled in different geographical and cultural contexts, they played both played crucial roles in the expansion and consolidation of their respective empires. Both rulers left lasting legacies in the realms of religion, culture, and politics, and military. military with their re reigns marking significant periods in the histories of the Kushan Empire and the Western Tsin or Tsin Dynasty more broadly. So that is um, the episode on the Kushan Empire and the Tsin Dynasty and highlighting K Kanishka I and Sima Yan in the Ages of Empire series. My name is Kaelin Ashcroft. Thank you very much for your support and I'd be very grateful if you continue to do so. Thank you so much.